this morning, but she doesn't have any issues. We're going to be reading the scripture from Galatians chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 10. Won't you join me as we read it together? Paul, an apostle, not sent from man, nor through human agency, but through Jesus Christ and God, the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you, peace from God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for sin so that we might be rescued us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever, amen. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not just another account, but there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accused. As we have said before, even now, I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what is received, he is to be accused. For I am seeking the favor of the people or of God, or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we ask, Father, that you would touch us, touch our hearts, our bodies, Father. The things of last week can flow away from us, Father. The concerns of next week can wait. We come to praise you today, Father. We come to receive your word. We come to fellowship, Father. We ask that you would touch our hearts, asking forgiveness, Father, for those things where we have had our moments of failure in your presence, knowing fully that, Father, you sent Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to be our Savior. You did it one time, Father, not requiring multiple times, and we know, Father, that we can take your hand and be used of you in your, in your kingdom, Father, as you continue to prepare and reconcile this world to yourself. 
We thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us, the blessings you've given to us that we know about, Father, and the blessings that we have received from you, Father, with no knowledge whatsoever. We thank you, Father. And when they all said together, Amen. You may be seated. Again, good morning to you and welcome to Mount Zion. We're here to worship this morning. We hope you are too. We want to have a good time praising the Lord and singing to the Lord and listening to the scripture as it's given to us. However, maybe this is your first time of being with us. And if it is, would you stand and let us recognize you? If this is your first time visiting with us, well, I can't really tell just yet. <laughs> but it doesn't, uh, I don't be sure. Okay, doesn't look like everybody is home folk today. So welcome, family. Amen. Enjoy your worship. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to sing this song about Jesus. Is that all right? Amen. Made a way for you. He made a way. 
First love me. Amen. Amen. His blood still works. His blood still works, and I'm glad to report that.
all know that the blood still works. It has continuing power. It never loses its power. You know that. How many of you called on the blood this morning? You asked God to apply the blood to your life. Amen. Bless you all. Well, today we have a special treat. Uh, Dr. Orge, as you know, is one of the elders of this church, and God has called him from the presidency of our seminary to serve as the president of our executive committee for Southern Baptists. And how many of you know what a city manager does? Well, that's what he'll be doing. It's like a city manager who knows everything about the city and is the one that makes things happen. So that's basically what he'll be doing for the largest Protestant denomination in the country. And so um, he's gonna break the bread of life he does have a lot of experience pastoring, but he has a lot of experience in denominational work, leadership. His lovely wife is here, Anne, and, and we are, we're absolutely delighted that you all are with us. And uh, let's receive Dr. Orge with a very warm Mount Zion welcome. Mount Zion, I know you're applauding for Pastor Brian Kennedy who was just out here and you're basically disappointed that he's not going to stay and preach, but this is what you get. So let's pray and ask God to help us. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being a part of Mount Zion Church. Thank you for how you've used this church to transform my life, make me a better Christian and a better leader. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do now through your word as we hear from you. And we look to you to teach us something insightful that will be cha transformational for us today. And we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and be seated. As you're being seated, open your Bibles with me to the book of Galatians in the New Testament, chapter 1. Galatians, chapter 1. Earlier in our service, we've had this passage of Scripture read. There are notes for you in your worship folder. I'll bring your attention to the text again as we go through it this morning. But I'd like to begin by asking you a question. Do you like things to be precise, exact, correct? Some of you aren't too sure. You think, that preacher's asking me a trick question. Well, it's not a trick question. It's a straight up one. Let me give you some examples and see how you do. Let's say you got a new job. You started it this week. And next week, pay time, pay, paycheck time came and they gave you your paycheck and it was $100 short. Would that be all right with you? I didn't think so. You want your paycheck to be right. Correct. Accurate. Here's another one. Let's say you go home from church today and you see your next door neighbor is out there digging holes to put a fence in between your houses. And you think, he's putting that fence in the wrong place. He's on my property. And you go out there and you say, hey, listen, friend, I don't mind you putting up a fence, but you're putting that fence up about 10 feet over the property line on my side. And your neighbor says, it's close enough. Don't worry about it. Is that going to be okay with you? Just checking, okay, just checking. How about one more? So you got a little medical condition and you get your medicine from the pharmacy, but when you get the pill bottle, you notice it doesn't have any dosage on it. So you call the pharmacist and you say, well, I received the medication, but it doesn't have a dosage on it. And she says, it don't matter, just take whatever you think. <laughs> whatever shakes out of the bottle, that's what you take. Now let me ask you a question. Are you going to take just whatever shakes out of the bottle? No. So now let me ask you a question. When it comes to your paycheck, your property line, and your medication, do you like things to be correct? Yes. Accurate? Yes. Right? Yes. I thought so. 
This is really not that unusual. We like precision when it's important. So then I ask you this question. Why is it when it comes to spiritual truth, we go soft? And we fall into this cultural trap that says, oh, just whatever you believe is all right. Whatever you think is just fine. Whatever you say is the standard, whatever you say is the line, whatever you say is the dosage, when it comes to spiritual truth, whatever you say is all right. You see, we can't be double-minded like this. We need things to be accurate and true and correct, not just in the property lines and medications and compensation, but also in what? Spiritual reality. And that's why I come to the text this morning in Galatians chapter 1, and I come to the theme of this message, no other gospel. The gospel is clearly communicated in this text. Join me and see that in verse 3. The Bible says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to him... Be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is one of the best summarizations of the gospel in the Bible. It's summarized in these four phrases. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Let's look at these four phrases just for a moment and see if we can understand what they're teaching us about the gospel and how they all together summarize the gospel in its truth and simplicity. It says, first of all, that Jesus gave himself, uh, excuse me, that Jesus gave himself for our sins. This tells us that Jesus participated in what theologians call voluntary atonement. He gave himself willingly for the sacrifice of our sins. In fact, in John 10, 11, Jesus said, No one takes my life from me. I instead, what? Lay it down. Jesus voluntarily, willingly, of his own volition, gave himself up for us that he might atone for our sins. The Bible says, Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. This is described throughout the New Testament in, particularly in great detail in the book of Hebrews and again summarized in Revelation chapter 5. Jesus willingly, voluntarily, of his own volition gave himself up for our sins that he might, get, that he might atone for us, meaning that he might make right our lives before God atoning for our sins. He did that. Jesus gave himself for our sins, now next phrase, to rescue us from this present evil age. Now you might think, now that's confusing to me because I'm still here. I'd like to be rescued from this present evil age. In fact, I'd like to be rescued before I go back to work tomorrow, okay? I, I'd like to get out of here, but I'm still here. So what does this mean when it says that Jesus willingly, voluntarily, of his own volition, gave himself for us that he might accomplish atonement for our sin in order to rescue us right now, not in the future, but to rescue us from this present evil age. Well, the, 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 the understanding of this verse hinges on the little word from. Notice it says, uh, notice what it, it says, who gave himself to rescue us from this present evil age. Now, without getting too much uh, into uh, grammar here, which makes a little of you nervous because it takes you back to middle school and that makes you really nervous, but we're going to have a little grammar lesson here. This word from is a preposition. And prepositions can have a lot of different shades of meaning in English and certainly in the Greek language of the New Testament. So when we are rescued from, what does it mean? Well, from can mean out of, meaning we've been rescued out of this present evil age, but that hasn't happened. We're still sitting here this morning right in the midst of the whole mess. So from must mean something else. In this context, it doesn't mean from meaning out of. It means from meaning in the midst of and from the effects of this present evil age. From the effects of rather than out of. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's suppose that 
we leave church and go down to Long Beach and get on a little boat. And we head out into the ocean for an afternoon of relaxing uh, boating. But we get out there and a storm comes up. We're in trouble. Just before our boat flips over, the captain hits the emergency transponders and the Coast Guard is alerted. Our boat flips. We're out there in our life jackets bobbing around in the ocean when suddenly we hear the sound of a Coast Guard rescue helicopter. And that helicopter comes and ho hovers over us. And a basket is lowered down. And we know what that means. They want us in that basket. So we get over into it any way we can. And that basket is raised up. And we fly back to safety. We've just been rescued out of the difficulty we were in. But that's not what happened here. Let me give you another same situation. We finish church. We go to Long Beach. We get on a boat. We get in the ocean. Same tr storm comes up. Same trouble happens. Uh, boat's just about to go down. We hit the same panic button, same Coast Guard helicopter comes, but this time, no basket. This time that helicopter ho hovers over us a little bit lower and out drops a rescue raft. Now, ladies, you'll like this. And four Navy SEAL type looking dudes. <laughs> All right? Okay? And the fellas are saying, I don't need those guys. I got this. Yeah, uh -huh, you got this. Anyway, those four Coast Guard, Navy SEAL looking fellas come out of there. They land in the water. They get you in the raft. They crawl in the raft and they start paddling you back to shore. You've just been saved. But now you've not been saved out of the trouble that you're in. What? You've been saved in the midst of the trouble you're in. You're still in the storm, but you're just safe because somebody's come to rescue you. Now that's what you have to understand when you look at this, prop, at this little preposition from. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us in the midst of and from the effects of this present evil age. So while you are still here, you've been saved from living in this present evil age in such a way that it impacts you, transforms you, or controls you. You've been saved in the midst of this present evil age. And then the Bible goes on. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who willingly, voluntarily, of his own free will and volition gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the effects of while we're in the midst of this present evil age and then according to the will of our God and Father. Jesus' death has always been God's plan. The Bible says Jesus Christ stood crucified from when? From the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ stands crucified from the foundation of the world as God's all-time plan for bringing people back to himself. And then, how does it end? According to the will of our God and Father, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. To him be the glory forever and ever. In fact, when all of this salvation process is ultimately concluded, we're all going to be in heaven forever and ever, and all that will be left in the universe is God's companion people resounding the pray, His praise forever and ever and ever and ever. Now let me see if I can summarize it for you. Here's the gospel encapsulated in one verse. God has always had a plan, and that plan was to send His Son Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ came for us willingly and voluntarily and offered Himself as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. And because he did this, he has rescued us. He has rescued us from this present evil age so that we now live in this world but not of this world. We now live in this world but not impacted or controlled by this world. We live in this world saved, delivered, freed. And this has always been God's plan. It's always been God's plan from the beginning of time until now. And ultimately, someday, it's going to result in praise to God only, not only now, but forever and forever. Is that all you got? I mean, come on now. Let, let, let me show you what happened right here in the Bible. Now, now remember, Paul is writing this letter to a church. And he just got started. He's just writing, writing the very first paragraph and he gets so caught up in the writing 
that in the middle of it, he says to himself and to his listeners and to all of us forever, Amen! <laughs> right there in the Bible. See it at the end of verse 5. I mean, he gets so worked up just writing it, he has to say his own Amen! Now, Mount Zion, I'm going to give you one more chance. Now, just get ready. Here's the gospel. God, the Father, has always planned for all time to send Jesus, who voluntarily and willingly came as our sacrifice. And in the process of dying for us, he made atonement for our sins. So why? So that we could be rescued, saved, delivered. Right here in the midst of this present evil age, from the effects of everything we're living in where this world no longer has control over us, but now we live free in this place we're calling, our, in the world we're living in now. And this is according to God's eternal plan for now and forever, and it results to His glory forever. Amen. Okay. Now you're getting it. It's pretty good right there. I'm telling you, the gospel is amazing. It's good news. It's wonderful. And it causes the writer to put the word amen right in the text and causes all of us to yell amen, get on our feet and, clear, and cheer a little bit. Woo! Amazing. But now listen. While the amens are still echoing in the air, listen to the next words. I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. While the raucous Cheering is echoing in the room. Paul says, Oh, you're on your feet cheering, sure. And that's why I'm so amazed that some are so quickly turning away. How quickly? Well, most Bible scholars believe that Galatians was written in the 50s. That's 20 years after the resurrection. 20 years is an eye blink of time. I became the president of Gateway Seminary 20 years ago this month. 20 years. Just like that. Some of the people who saw Jesus resurrected were still alive. We're, we're talking about in the very first generation, those who had actually seen Jesus and touched Jesus and, and witnessed his miracles and experienced his power and even saw him, the Bible says over 500 eyewitnesses after the resurrection, some who'd seen him even after he was resurrected, those people are still alive. And Paul writes, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of God and are turning to a different gospel. So church, this tells us something important. Error about the gospel has been around for a long time. And vigilance about holding to the gospel has been needed for a long time. So we should not be surprised that there are threats to the gospel, questions about the gospel, accusations over the gospel, or people who ignore or contradict the gospel. We should not be surprised. It's been around a long time. And we have to be vigilant, which is what Paul is calling for here in the rest of this text. But let me ask you another question. Where does this error about the gospel, questions about the gospel, new interpretations of the gospel, where does this come from? Where does it originate? 
Well, the Bible then in the next verses gives us three sources of heresy or three sources of confusion about the gospel. So let's keep reading. Verse 7. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you. Here's our first category. Some. Anonymous experts who know about the gospel. Now, Pastor Brian has three fellows that often make it into his sermons. And when these men are in the sermon, I go home and tell my wife, it was a good one today. You know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about T-Dog, Maniac, and Ray Ray. We've met these people. Pastor Brian tells us that T-Dog, Maniac, and Ray Ray, they're, they're down on the street corner and they know everything about everything. They want to tell you how to live your life, how to manage your relationships, how to deal with your money. They want to tell you about life. And he frequently reminds us that these brothers on the street corner will lead us astray. A few years ago when Barack Obama was running for president, he invented his own character. Remember him? He said, your cousin Pookie. <laughs> you, you, you remember him? You all got one, don't you? Yes. President Obama said cousin Pookie was that fellow who sits on the couch at home and pontificates about everything but won't get up and do anything about anything. Some of you have him in your, in your family. You know who I'm talking about. Look, whether it's T-Dog or Maniac or Ray Ray or Cousin Pookie or some other anonymous person, there are all kinds of people who claim to be authorities that will tell us what to think and believe and trust and do. I was watching a mockumentary on television. You got right. I, you heard me right over there. A mockumentary. Now, I know that not any man in this room does this but me, but I actually sometimes yell back at the television. <laughs> and my wife will say, you know they can't hear you. And I say, I don't care. And I just let them have it. I'm yelling at the TV. I'm watching a mockumentary, and they're saying, you know, some people believe that the Gospels have errors. Some people believe that Jesus was a composition of historical events and characters. And I'm yelling at the TV, who? Name one. Talk to me about the sources. Mockumentary, anonymous experts. You know what I'm talking about. Person that says, "Well, I heard on the I heard on the radio, I saw it on the internet, I, it was on TV. My grandmama told me this. My aunt or my uncle. I had a cousin once. When I went, I went to high school with a guy who said that. Am I the only one who hears this kind of stuff on a constant basis? It's right here in the Bible." There are some who are troubling you. Anonymous experts. People who have no credential or identity or background, but plenty to say about things like the gospel. Here we read on. There are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we... Oh, let's stop there now. This is going to be a little harder. We... Who's we? Well, in this context, the we are prominent Christian leaders. We. Paul said, even if we, those of us who are prominent Christian leaders, even if we alter the gospel, you need to reject what we say. I will tell you that one of the great shocks and disappointments in my 40 years of ministry leadership has been, has been people who are prominently recognized as religious, or excuse me, as Christian leaders in this country, standing now, uh, that stand up for things that are contrary to the Bible and the Word of God. I, I am astounded when I see people with clerical robes on standing in front of television cameras and telling me that God honors anything other than a man and a woman married for life. I don't understand that. 
I, I can understand a secular person saying that. I can understand a lost person saying that. I can understand a person of another religion or another culture saying that. I can understand where this comes from. But when I see a person who supposedly represents God and the gospel and the book stand up and tell me things that are diametrically opposed to what it says, I am shocked and disappointed by that. You say, well... If prominent Christian leaders like Paul say that even if we lead you astray, does that mean that some will? Yes, it does. And so you might think, well, then I can't trust anyone. Yes, you can. Here it is. The most important resource you have is your own ability to read your own Bible. <laughs> read your own Bible and find and follow men who will teach it from you, uh, who will pastor you and teach you the Word of God as you find it revealed in Scripture. And if they're doing that, trust them. Follow them. Give them your allegiance and your support. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But if you find them saying something that contradicts the plain sense, the plain teaching, the plain words of the Bible, get away from them as fast as possible. We. Well, anonymous experts are a source of error about the gospel, and sometimes, unfortunately, even prominent Christian leaders can be a source of confusion or heresy or distortion of the gospel. But let's read on. But even if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what you've heard. Now you're thinking, well, we won't be long on this one because I know there's no angel ever preached in this church. There's not one up there right now, I can tell you that for sure. You're thinking that, aren't you? So you think, well, we're off the hook on this one. We don't need to worry about anything about an angel from heaven getting us off the true gospel. Well, let me explain that you do. Because here's what happens. Angelic revelation gets passed down a few generations and people forget that it was the origination of so much that's religiously wrong in our world today. Let me give you two examples. The fastest growing so-called Christian movement which distorts the true gospel today is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. How did it start? Well, Joseph Smith claims that an angel named Moroni, an angel in, in 1823 gave him a vision of where he could dig up some plates which were inscribed with something which is now known as the Book of Mormon. Now there is no question, but over the past almost now 200 or about 200 years, the Mormon church has morphed into something that is very different than it may have looked like in 1823. But let's not forget where it started. It started with a man who said an angel told him to dig up plates which have a book which contradicts the Bible as the Word of God. So you may think of your friends who are Mormons today, and they may be good people and upright people and may make some positive contribution to our community and even to, our, to, to your workplace. But what they believe is rooted in this challenge of verse 8. If an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we've preached to you, a curse be on him. And in the religious movement which has created the most difficulty in our world, at least in the last hundred years and certainly in my generation, is Islam. How did it start? In 610, Muhammad claims that the angel Gabriel gave him a series of revelations which resulted in the Quran. He claims that his revelations were angelic in their origin. And so while we look today at all the things that are going on with Islam all around the world, it's easy to forget that it all started because an angel came along and gave a later revelation. Now, this morning, it's not my intent to single out and attack just these two movements. It's my intent to show you that what verse 8 says is real in our world today. An angel from heaven supposedly has revealed something that does contradict the gospel, and we need to be on alert about that. So don't think that this verse doesn't apply anymore because you've never seen an angel. Someone who claims to have seen one comes along and gives you a revelation that contradicts the gospel, you need to be aware of where it originated. So here's what we've learned so far. The gospel is simple and summarized. God has always had a plan. That plan is Jesus. 
Jesus came willingly and voluntarily, died for you as an atoning sacrifice for your sin to rescue you or save you in the midst of this present evil age. That's to God's glory. It'll resound to His glory forever and we all say amen. amen. But then, amen. but then, while the amens are echoing in the air, we recognize that it is so easy to be deceived and to fall away from the true gospel. And we have to be on guard against anonymous experts and religious teachers and even other religious movements that are contradicting the simplicity of the gospel as described in this passage. But we come to conclude now with two other insights. Why is my message today so divisive? And it is divisive. When you believe in the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation, you will be called narrow-minded, bigoted, fundamentalistic, legalistic. You'll be accused of being small-minded, and arrogant, religiously intolerant. These are the things that will be said of you if you believe what I'm saying to you this morning. But the text goes on to describe why this is so divisive and why it's so difficult. It says in verse 8 and 9, If anyone is preaching a different gospel, a curse be on him. And as we have said before, I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, a curse be on him. This word curse is a word anathema, which means set aside for destruction. The reason that holding to the gospel is so difficult and the consequences so serious is because when you change the gospel, you invite God's judgment. That's a terrifying thought, isn't it? We have such a truncated and often warped view of God. People say of him, oh, he's the man upstairs. We treat God as if he's some benevolent old man who pats us on the head occasionally. May I remind you that God is our holy father who, is, who has standards of righteousness that he wants his people to follow and achieve. And in the recognition of our brokenness and inability, he has made it possible through Jesus for us to have forgiveness and sustaining grace to keep striving for his perfection. And to alter that invites his judgment. I don't say that this morning to frighten you or to terrify you or to discourage you. I say it to sober you and to help you understand that knowing the gospel is a precious gift and Rejecting it or changing it is a fearful, fearsome thing to be involved in. Stop it. But now we come to the end and to the real reason why this is so difficult. Verse 10. Paul writes, For am I now trying to persuade people or God? And then this great question, Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. The reason that this message is so divisive and so difficult is because when you hold to the gospel, you will have to make a choice at some point in your life of whether you will continue to do so and please God or whether you will compromise it in some way in order to make peace, keep the peace, are to please the people around you. Let me say it this way. The easiest place to hold to the exclusivity of the gospel is the seminary classroom. That's easy. The second easiest place to hold to the exclusivity of the gospel is the pulpit of a Baptist church. It's not hard to do this today. Those are easy places. Let me tell you the hard place. The hard place is this afternoon when you're having lunch with your grandson who rejects everything you stand for. And you want to have a conversation with him about the gospel. And he said, I don't believe that old stuff. I'm not that old-timey religion. I don't want anything to do with your Jesus. 
Your, your Jesus is narrow-minded and bigoted and closed off and promotes a culture I can't even find a way to be comfortable in. You see, when you start having real conversations with real people, that's when it gets real hard to hold on to the gospel. And that's what Paul says here. Am I striving to please people? That's why it's so hard, because it comes down to personal conversations. It's going to work tomorrow. And in a break room, hearing someone ridiculing religion and Christianity and making fun of Jesus, and you saying, hang on just a minute. Let me tell you the truth about what you're saying. And the room gets quiet. And now the spotlight's on you. This is what I'm talking about this morning. You see, it's one thing to talk about the gospel in these grand terms. It's a, another thing to critique error and where it comes from and show you in Scripture its sources. But it's a whole other thing to bring it down to where we live, isn't it? And to understand that what makes this message so divisive is not preaching it in a pulpit on a Sunday morning, but living it at your workplace and in your home on a Wednesday afternoon. To where you find yourself having real-time conversations with your family members, your work colleagues, your friends, your associates. You find yourself in real-life situations where you're put on the spot and you have to decide, do I really believe this and am I really going to speak up about it? Or, to borrow the text, the language of verse 9, or am I going to please people and just sit here quietly and say nothing? Or am I going to please people and laugh at the jokes and just go along? Am I going to please people and agree with what's being said just to avoid the conflict that might ensue? Brothers and sisters, there is no other gospel. There is no other gospel. It's described in verses 3 and 4 and 5. We're warned about the cost of giving it up in verses 6 through 9. But then in verse 10, hmm, we have it brought down to where we live. And that's what makes it so difficult this morning. So here's my invitation to you this morning. My first invitation is for those of you who are Christians to reaffirm your commitment to the gospel. And not just to the gospel in theory or to the gospel in church or to the gospel in a book, but to say, Lord, I'm going to believe the gospel and I'm going to take it with me to work tomorrow. And I'm going to take it to my family lunch, dinner uh, tonight and I'm going to take it with me everywhere I go, and I'm going to be willing to stand up for you and for the gospel. Lord, I will stand up for the gospel. And I'm going to ask you to pray and say, Lord, it'll be divisive some days and hard some days, but I don't want to be a people pleaser. I want to please you. And I pray you'd help me to do that. And I know what I'm asking some of you. Some of you are thinking, I'm not good with words. I understand that. Some of you are thinking, I'm, I'm afraid, I understand that. Some of you are thinking, this is going to be hard, and I certainly understand that. But God will sustain you if you will stand with the gospel. He'll help you to say words you didn't know you had, to have a backbone you didn't know you, you had grown, to have the courage to do what's right in the middle of a difficult situation, and He'll help you to learn to be winsome and personable, not to be offensive or, or confronted. I'm praying today and asking that you will say to God, I will stand for the gospel. And now, let me talk to a few of you who've come this morning, that this has been more personal in a different way. You've been told lies about the gospel. You've been told, oh, all religions are about the same. Oh, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. You've been told these things. And I'm here this morning to tell you those are wrong. There aren't a lot of Gospels. It does matter what you believe. Sincerity is not the same as faith in the true God. And so I'm appealing to you this morning. If you've come to Mount Zion Church hoping to hear a word that would change your life, you're hearing it right now. The Gospel will change you forever. It will change you forever. 
And all you have to do this morning is open your life to God and say, Heavenly Father, I turn from my sin, I place my faith in Jesus, and I surrender myself to you and believe your gospel. That simple kind of prayer that I'm going to lead you in in just a moment, that simple kind of prayer will transform you today as God gives you the gift of salvation. So every person in the room can respond this morning. A lot of us praying for more courage about the gospel. But a few of us, maybe for the very first time, putting our faith in Jesus and receiving the gospel into our lives. Would you bow your heads with me just now and let's spend some moments praying. If you're here today and you'd reaffirm your commitment to the gospel and ask for greater courage to express that to people, would you pray this way with me? Father, Father, work in my life. Give me greater confidence about the gospel. Give me greater courage to talk about the gospel with people I know. Oh God, give me the grace to believe the gospel. Now if you're here today and you're considering the gospel for the first time, would you pray with me this way? Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Just now I confess my sins and I turn to you as my Savior and Lord. Come into my life and change me forever. If you're praying these prayers on the authority of the Bible, my experience as a Christian and my testimony as a Christian leader, God is answering your prayers. He will answer your prayers to give you greater courage about the gospel. And if you've prayed and asked him into your life today, he'll give you the courage to live out the gospel now as a new Christian. God is hearing and answering prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you're doing around this room just now as you move in our hearts to give us confidence that you've heard us and you're answering our prayers today. Now, Father... Thank you so much, thank you so much for the gospel, for what it means in our lives, and for how you're transforming us by the gospel. And Lord, give us greater courage than we've ever had to stand up for the gospel in our families, in our workplaces, among our friends, to take the risk to please you instead of people. Thank you for hearing my prayer this morning and for giving me the grace and strength to preach this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. If you're here today and you prayed and asked Jesus Christ into your life for the very first time, this is your moment, of day, your moment and your day of salvation. As soon as this service concludes, walk down to the front, talk to me or Pastor Brian or one of the other church leaders. Let us know of your decision so we can help you to know how to move forward in faith. Now it's time for our morning offering. I have loved giving to Mount Zion for the eight years I've been a member. It's a good church to give your tithes and offerings because you know the money's being used with integrity to make a difference in our community and around the world. And so I'm grateful to be able to give and thankful to all of you who do and who share with that, that responsibility week by week. Let's pray together and then we'll receive our morning offering. Heavenly Father, thank you for this offering and the way you will use it to advance your kingdom. Bless give the givers and the gifts to expand your work around the world. And we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amber, and here are your weekly announcements. We are excited to invite you to a very special event happening on April 20th at 10 a.m. in the Mount Zion Cafe. NAMI In Our Own Voice is a unique public education program in which presentations consist of two trained speakers sharing their compelling personal stories of living with mental health challenges and achieving recovery. Audiences range from individuals living with mental health challenges, students of all ages, law enforcement officials, and faith community members to veterans and service providers. 
Get ready for an empowering experience at our Men's Ministry Conference, Basic Life Support. Join us on Saturday, April 27th, as we gather to equip ourselves with essential faith-driven skills that dives into believing, living, and studying the Word. Secure your spot now by scanning the QR code provided on the screen, or visit the church's website at mountzionontario.com to complete your registration online. Join us for a joyous occasion as the Mount Zion Ministries proudly present the Go Sunday Celebration on April 21st from 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. This special event marks a significant milestone as we come together to commemorate and celebrate all the remarkable achievements in our evangelism and discipleship endeavors. Please note that there will be no Sunday school held on this day. As we devote our entire focus to the Ghost Sunday celebration, we encourage everyone to join us and be a part of this uplifting experience. We look forward to sharing this special moment with you and experiencing the joy of fellowship as one united family. We're thrilled to invite you to our special Mother's Day event happening on May 4th at 12 p.m. in the Mount Zion Cafe. Tickets for this heartwarming event are available for $25. You can conveniently purchase them through the church's website or visit the table located in the front of the sanctuary. Don't miss out on this special celebration. Mount Zion Summer Day Camp is an eight-week full-day experience designed to engage children ages 5 through 11. Our mission is to provide an opportunity for kids from diverse backgrounds to encounter Christ, build healthy relationships with others, and continue to grow academically in a safe and fun environment. Registration begins May 1st. For more details, contact Miss Yvonne in the Children's Ministry. The Teen and Creative and Performing Arts Workshop has started the application process. Get hands-on experience in our filmmaking and TV commercial labs, including studio field trips. You'll also dive into the world of theater acting. Learn how to captivate your audience and express yourself anywhere with confidence. This exclusive workshop runs for three weeks from June 3rd to the 21st. Space is limited, so secure your spot early. Register before May 5th. Contact Mr. J for more details. Join us on June 9th at 2 p.m. for a momentous occasion as we celebrate the achievements and milestones of our students at the annual graduation ceremony. This year we draw inspiration from the theme, God is always working for your good, reflecting the profound message of Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Whether you or your loved ones are graduating from high school, college, or a trade program, or promoting from preschool, elementary, or junior high, Mount Zion is excited to honor your hard work and dedication. This is a wonderful opportunity to commemorate the significant step in your education journey surrounded by friends, family, and the Mount Zion community. Additionally, we are thrilled to offer a scholarship opportunity for high school graduates. For more details and to register for the ceremony, please refer to the registration form provided. Please stay in touch with us throughout the week by scanning our QR code or following us online. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, have a blessed week, family. First of all, we talked about no other gospel, mm -hmm. right? And so my first question, you know, at the beginning you talked about we should have the same conviction about being right in spiritual truths as we do with paychecks and property lines, right? So in an age, though, of don't judge me, you know, how do we correct different versions of what people believe and even what they've been taught about spiritual truths so that it's heard and not, you know, they don't just turn off? Yeah. And go away. You know, that's, that question is really so simple. I'm going to have Dr. Brian Kennedy come out here and answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> Introduce it. No, no I'm, just I'm just kidding. Anyway, <laughs> hey, that, that's a great question. And I think that um, the, the, what, I would, what I maybe didn't communicate as well in the message, what I'd like to say is when we have these conversations, it's not about convincing or arguing mm -hmm. or, or in some way... Uh, putting another person down for what they think or believe. It's about representing what we believe accurately right. and not feeling like we have to compromise that just to go along with the other person's perspective. Right. And so doing this, the, one of the great words that I learned years ago is the word winsome. Mm. We want to be winsome, meaning we want to win the person with our attitude and our, and our demeanor, not just with our words. Mm. And so I would say that uh, this, this message about no other gospel is not designed to make us argumentative or to make us mean-spirited, but instead to make us clear and, okay. and, uh, and willing to hold to our position in a winsome way. Gotcha. Yeah. 
All right, and so kind of a follow up to that, you know, we talked about these anonymous experts and people who just claim to have authority on things. But, you know, can we tell people that they're just wrong or is that a little bit too harsh? <laughs> it, it, it's not too harsh okay. and, and it's, it's appropriate to say, but rather than just say you're wrong, what I would say when someone comes at me that's tr quoting some anonymous source, I mm -hmm. say, where'd you get that idea? Mm -hmm. Or what are you basing that on? Questions. And one of the questions that I often ask is, you know, have you actually uh, read the Bible and mm -hmm. looked at what it actually has to say? Right. And help people to understand, you know, don't just take someone else's word for it. Really look at the primary source or look for, for just someone who maybe has some a little more authoritative position than, yeah. you know, your Do dad's friends on the street corner. Right. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> Do some research. Yeah. All right. And then this question comes from the audience. And okay. they ask, how should we view or behave regarding Christian movements who focus more on political agenda than being biblical? Well, I think that... The pro one of the big problems in American Christianity right now, just across the, the spectrum, is mm -hmm. we're promoting, we're putting too much emphasis on things that have a little bit of importance, but they're not ultimately important. Yeah. I think it does matter that we say something about social issues and political issues, but we can't let those become the most important thing we're talking right. about or the most important part of our message. Um, and and I, I've said it this way, if, if we fixed all of the political and social problems in our country, and those people die, they die happy, but they die separated from God. Mm. We have an eternal message that's the gospel, and we can't compromise that or forget that's our primary message. Now, these other things are important, but they have to be kept in a proper perspective, mm. not the focus of the main, not the main focus of what we're doing as churches right. or even movements, so. All right, and then, you know, my last No, question. you just get three, now come on. Uh, well, this one is just to talk about you. <laughs> I'm good. You go ahead. I All like right. you. You can ask me 20 questions <laughs> oh, if you thank want. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this one is just, we want to know what God is calling you to do on the executive committee. Yeah. Well, let me uh, be brief about this, but okay. if I could just tell you this one part of the story, I think it would be helpful to many of you. Um, I, I've never wanted to be the president of the executive committee. Uh, years ago, I was asked to consider it, and I, I said no, and and I just simply knew it wasn't for me. And so when we made the decision to step away from Gateway last year after my 20th year, it was truly to step into retirement. Uh, we were planning to move into a quieter ministry season. I still intended to preach and teach, but not to have the public role or, or responsibility that I've had. And the executive committee was searching for a president for over two years. And this last January 23rd, they were preparing with just in a day or two of announcing a candidate who would have been very fine. And on January 23rd, that candidate called and said, I'm not taking the job. I'm not the right person. Mm -hmm. And that morning, I woke up here on the West Coast to a, text, a phone full of text messages, all from people back in the East who'd been up two hours more, longer than I had, <laughs> texting each other and bringing me into the loop, all saying the same thing we need to ask Jeff Orge to step forward and take this responsibility. And within, 36, or within uh, 72 hours, I'd say conservatively, 50 people in prominent leadership roles contacted me and asked me to step forward and do this responsibility. And so we had a choice to make. Would we continue down the path toward retirement we were on, or would we take on this task? And Honestly, from the very beginning when I heard the other person had withdrawn and people started calling me, the weight of responsibility for it fell on me in a way I can't really describe. I just had a sense that this is something I'm going to need to step into and lead. So to answer your question, what do I plan to do when I get there? I plan to be myself and to lead from the perspective I have and to try to make a viable contribution for the next few years. Um, look, I'm, I, I know how old I am. I'm not their 20-year man, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not their 20-year man. But I am a person who has been doing this for a long time and has the at least trust and respect of a number of people. And I think if I come in with uh, the same kind of decision-making I've demonstrated here, maybe it will be helpful going forward. So I'm not going with a great vision. I'm going with a great uh, commitment mm. to bringing stability and leadership to what is, what is a very challenging role in our world. So, yeah. yeah. Well, we are excited for you and we're thank praying you. for you. Hey, and I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> and now I think uh, Kennedy wants to get out here. He's, he can't stand it. He didn't get to preach. So. <laughs> yeah. All messed up.
messed up, but that sermon today got me right, boy. Okay. That was some good stuff. Amen. All right. Come on, let's bring let's bring Ann Orange on the stage. Yeah. They are entering into a huge responsibility. And Ann has served in our children's ministry here for eight years. She has served at the South uh, uh, Ontario Ranch Campus, and <clears throat> she's been serving at the City Connect Campus and helping us develop our children's ministries. It's just been a joy serving with you. This one here flies all over the country, and his wife gets to serve here, and what an honor. <clears throat> what an honor to serve with this couple. We... We call them like a power couple, amen? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> amen. And we want to pray for them. Mount yeah. Zion, uh, on Tuesday at Gateway Seminary, we're going to have a commissioning service for them. But we're their church. Right. And we want to pray for them today. Amen? Amen? And so I'm going to ask as our children, you come on, youth and children, you come on because you are... A right. major part of the Orge's lives. Amen. Amen. And, and will you stand with us as we prepare to ask God's blessings on their life? Pastor Grice, nice to see you today. Come on up. He pastors our sister church in Pomona. Uh, Mount Zion Pomona is six months older than Mount Zion, Ontario. These pastors knew each other. Come on, Grace, come on up here so people can see who you are. So nice of you to take time to join us. We were talking about, he's also a Gateway student, and, and I push hard to get pastors in Gateway. And, and so he loves Dr. Words, and he just wanted to come by before his service and be a part of this. Will you extend your hand toward Dr. Orge and, and Orge as we pray God's blessings on them as they go to this next responsibility. Father, God, we thank you for the privilege yes. to have Dr. Orge and Sister Ann Orge in our midst to serve so faithfully here on the West Coast, here in Southern California. You started up north and moved the seminary here and just served so faithfully here. And God, you've called him to our convention to give leadership at our executive committee level in the convention and just a core, the hub, the brain, the CPU of our convention. And God, he needs your wisdom, yes, your knowledge, your understanding. He will need patience from you. He will need supernatural strength from you and Anne will need the same thing as she stands faithfully by his side. And God, they're going to need more than they've ever needed from you before as they move to this next level in leadership, in ministry. And God, I ask that you will let your hand of favor be upon him. Continue to be upon him and use him and use Anne in great and mighty ways. Oh, God, do for them what... Only you can do as he promotes this gospel, this saving gospel, this message of hope for the world as he realigns us to focus on the gospel and to serve. Oh, God, use him in great and mighty ways. We remember these children who are in our midst. Oh, God, the these precious, precious children that you say are a blessing from you. And we're asking, oh God, that you strengthen them right now, that you protect them from evil people and evil things, and that you'll guide them along the way and that you'll be a light in their lives. God, we love you so much. We're so honored to be your children and to serve you, to be called by your name. We're just honored. And we're asking, Lord, that you'll go with us this week and brighten our lights. Help us to be salty salt 
Help us to speak up for you like the preacher said today, that we will be bold and share the gospel with men and women, boys and girls, within our sphere of influence. Use us in great and mighty ways. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. If you want to talk to Dr. Orge after the service, you want to greet Dr. Orge or Sister Orge, come on up. They're right here and would love to have time with you.